All right, uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started since we're running a little late. All right. So, hi everyone, my name is Grant Schofield. Um, if you didn't guess from the big uh, slide, I work at the 10,000 pound girl in the Ruby room right now, uh, Engine Yard. I've worked with Engine Yard since March after moving on uh, as the primary developer of adrive.com. I'm a support engineer um, and that uh, that's a little bit different of a role at, uh, at Engine Yard than most places. Support engineer encompasses not only being able to develop and you know, debug Ruby applications, but also understanding systems infrastructure as well. I am an Okie, I'm from Oklahoma City, uh, and I always kind of looked down upon Texas, and then I went to a gas station, found some really nice beer at 10 p.m., and found out I could buy it till midnight, and that's a lot better than what we have in Oklahoma City. Uh, you can uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, under Schofield. So I want to talk a little bit about the cloud in general first because I think that the cloud has taken on this, this sort of web 2.0 idea. The cloud means a lot of different things to a lot of people now. You know, uh, we, ha we have all these different things coming about, but they're really all old ideas. People used to timeshare on mainframes. They used to share these systems. And we've just taken that idea, applied the internet, and applied all these new tricks, and now we have you know, supposedly this OS that's going to run completely on the cloud. Um, so, you know, what we, while we're evolving, I suppose we're going back to the old ideas as well. There's a few different types of uh, cloud computing, um, and software as a service is one of those, and I think that's the one that most people are familiar with. People are familiar with, of course, Google Apps, using uh, CRM software on salesforce.com, Twitter, and the way that I look at it, really the internet is becoming the software as the service now. Everything we do is online. Everything we do is on the internet. There's also the idea of infrastructure as a service, and these are people like Rackspace Cloud, GoGrid, Sun has a system, VMware is going to one day have a system, Amazon Web Services. These are all uh, providing the base tools you need to actually do something, and that's where we come in. We're entering the market as a platform as a service, just like Google App Engine, Windows Azure, Salesforce is actually getting into that as well, um, and I didn't mention Spring Source, uh, but you know those are another bunch of people uh, doing platform as a service. So the Engine Yard Cloud. The Engine Yard Cloud is pretty much divided up into two pricing plans pretty much with the same features, and those are Solo and Flex. Flex is a beta product right now um, that has Solo pricing. You can get on, try it out. The difference between Solo and Flex is Solo only allows you to run one instance, whereas Flex is going to allow you to run multiple instances or a cluster. Runs on top of AWS, so it leverages all those nice things that AWS gives you, like elastic black block storage, or you know, we give you your S3 uh, credentials, so you can even use you know, S3 to out to your clients, just not internally as well. Um, one of the big ideas that our development team brings, brings to the idea of the cloud is the infrastructure as code, having these repeatable things that we can click a few buttons and spin up a few servers and have that server just like just be like all the other servers, uh, but tweakable as well and customizable. And then the Engine Yard stack is one of the one of the key things I think that may set the uh, our cloud product apart because we've been working you know our uh, you know some of our lead guys like Ez have been using Nginx for years and been big proponents of Nginx and so we bring all that knowledge and all those those years of experience and we're applying it to our cloud product well now don't get ca be caught up in all of the, the the cloud stuff right now there's a lot of people saying the cloud is the future it's not going to be the future for everyone you just don't want to get on the cloud because you want to be cool and if you're doing it wrong, the cloud can actually be a liability. If you're doing a high amount of I.O., there's reasons why people like Facebook or Twitter aren't running on the cloud. Something like Cassandra, which is very, very high O, is not going to necessarily fit really well in the cloud. So you need to look at your requirements and look at what you need to do. The cloud is not going to kill all your rabbits for you. It's going to solve some, some problems for you and can solve them very well, but it's not going to solve all your problems. So sometimes you may need to take a step back, look at your problems and reassess, is the cloud the right solution for me? Or do I need to change my application to better take use of the tools that I'm, I currently have? Now, in my past, I was a sysadmin. Uh, in Boston, I worked for a company called ITA Software. It managed thousands of Linux boxes. And there's always something very nice about the tactical, you know, that tactile aspect of a server or you know, a NetApp or my switch or my P Baytech PDU. There's all these things that I can touch. I can go into the data center. I can kick it if it's being bad at night. You know, having that physicality is really nice. And I think that being a, a system in that's wor worked in large environments, that's something I always liked. What I didn't like was filling out all the POs and having to wait three months for that hardware. 
So that's where we get into the idea of instant provisioning. Whenever I had to order 100 servers, it would take me months in order to get the right people to approve, get the vendor who, you know, uh, you know, could be Dell, could be anyone, to actually deliver those boxes. I'm going to have to sit down, you know, have someone configure all those boxes, or you use Red Hat Kickstart, or, you know, do whatever I need to do. And that takes a long time. Um, and so, you know, in, in this modern age with uh, things like TechCrunch and Dig, you know, you need those 50 servers one day. You don't need those, those servers the next day. So the, what our product allows you to do is it allows you to instantly provision boxes as you need them. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite things is the, how easy the deployment is. I mean, I think that when everyone started using Capistrano many years ago, we were all really taken with how easy deployment became. But it's getting easier because of this idea of infrastructure as, the co infrastructure as code. We also provide a lot of flexibility that I like um, because what you're able to do is because of this instrument provisioning, I can spin up a test server and I can run a long running process like a migration and see if it actually works and not have to worry about when I move this to production, is my whole site going to be down for four hours and the migration fails and you know, I'm chasing my tail to fix things. And sadly, unfortunately, I think, you know, as time goes on, there's going to be less and less needs for, you know, startups to have sysadmins because everyone's working in the cloud and it's making it so easy. You don't need to know, need, know all those, you know, really esoteric uh, Nginx configuration things to get your site running optimally. So finally, we're going to go ahead and uh, do some stuff now. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go over to our cloud environment and uh, we could use Quick Start uh, to get things a little... Uh, done, done a little faster, but I'm going to go ahead and take it the long way. Um, the app that we're actually going to be working with is a personal app of mine uh, that I deploy on the Nginx Cloud, which is called Twerkle. Uh, we'll go ahead and use my username with that. You have a, a choice of Nginx and, uh, and uh, Mongrel and Nginx and Passenger environment. Uh, Apache Passenger is a bit legacy. It's going away. Um, this is actually our staging environment, so I guess that's uh, why it's still sticking around there. So I've just created my environment. I'm going to go ahead and do an application. Oops, hit enter too soon. We're going to give it a GitHub URL where my repository sits. With, uh, you can actually use different applications. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of uh, you know, Merb and Rack stuff, um, but those are available as well. I'm going to go ahead and choose Rail, Rails 233 and the domain name. Um, we're just going to go ahead and throw that in there for now. And we're going to create our application. So there's a, there's a few more steps involved. We're going to need to take uh, anyone familiar with Git and uh, doing deploys probably with uh, Capistrano. We're going to go ahead and go add this key over to our GitHub repository. So we can s do our code. Oops, wrong key. I'll fail. Yeah, I think you're right. There we go. Good call. So there we go. We have our GitHub uh, deploy key in place. We'll check that again. Um, when you're setting up your instance, you have the option to add gems. Uh, we'll send a shout out to James, and we'll just add cert, uh, faster CSV. We can choose specific versions, add those gems to the environment. You can also do that with Unix pack packages. If you, need, if you need to call out uh, to anything you may need. And that's pretty much it. And then once we're set up, our environment, we can go ahead and create instances. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, eh, we're going to want three application servers. Uh, these, you have different options of the different levels of Amazon systems you want. We're forced to use a separate database since we have multiple application servers. We'll keep everything else the default. We'll go ahead and boot this configuration. So we see here now what we have is we have our three application servers booting with our master database. Now these are automatically load balanced. If we lose one of, the, if we lose one of these instances, that instance is, are, is automatically going to be replaced for us. So there's lots of bells and whistles that we give you with the system as well. We, we give you built-in monitoring. Right now we don't do external monitoring. That'll be coming really soon. Uh, it'll monitor your applications, uh, you know, monitor your memory usage. If your memory usage is, you know, if you have less than a few percent of memory for a certain amount of time, we're going to email you that ten times and we're not going to spam you, we're going to stop it. But we do give you the monitoring abilities, usage graphs such as your I.O. usage, 
network usage, et cetera. Really painless SSL certificates. SSL certificates are a, flu a few clicks away. You can either use a self-generated or self-signed cert, cert, or you can use upload your own. And uh, other, other tools we give you are the backup tools. Um, we use Elastic Block Storage System uh, from Amazon, which gives you the ability to do incremental snapshots. So you'll take a snapshot. The next one you take is going to be incremental. So you can recover any state of your system if you need to. We also have built-in uh, MySQL dumps, and all of these things are configurable. So uh, we do support uh, Capistrano for deploys. You can go into our application and go ahead and grab, uh, and grab your deploy RB and deploy just like you're used to. But what we've tried to do with the system is bring a few other tools to the table, and what we're using is we're using Chef for deploys now. And that gives you post-deploy hooks just like Capistrano would give you, but you actually check those into your code base. You can do one-click deploys, and I'll show that right now. And then you can also do, uh, use Git's, uh, GitHub's ability to do post-commit hooks or actually uh, any Git repository. You could uh, implement that yourself. So we see our, uh, our system still coming up. The servers are going to wait on each other, wait for, the, wait for the database to boot, but they're all in uh, different states, but eventually they'll come up. So we're going to go ahead and pull the, uh, the cooking show thing where I have a little cluster already started up for us so we can go ahead and look at it. So we have a, a pretty much an exact mirror of the environment that we had before, one database, three application servers. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go over to my application, my Torkoal application, uh, and we'll just edit some code here and save that. We'll go, let's do a git. push that up to GitHub. And then before we deploy, what we'll go ahead and do is we'll look at the, the current version of the website. Since I have multiple versions running, we're just going to go ahead and use the IP and not worry about host names or anything like that. So I have the Torkoal application here. We're going to go ahead and go over to the cloud, and we're going to deploy. Now, I don't have any, of course, I don't have any migrations in here, so we're just going to go ahead and deploy our code. And you can choose different things. You can choose different uh, Git branches if you want to. And so when you click deploy, any configuration changes that need to be made, like if you added an SSL cert, if you have a new uh, SSH key, things like that, those are going to be deployed as well. And as we can see, we're deploying across everything but the database server. We're deploying the application now. There we go. We actually use HA proxy to load balance in between all the individual servers. Amazon does offer a load balancing system as well. We find the configurability and the control that we have with the HA proxy is really great. So we've deployed our code, so hopefully if I uh, did things right when I refresh what we're going to see is we're going to see the little change I made there. Now, going to the website and hitting deploy and one click your code is, uh, is a lot of fun, but we can also do a few, uh, a few other tricks with that as well using uh, uh, get uh, post commit hooks, um, specifically with GitHub. So we'll go ahead and save that. Now, before we do that, what we actually need to do is we're going to need to go to our application here. And as you saw, we'll have the deploy RB is over there. But what I can do is I can click here and I can get a specific URL that we're going to, we can go over here into GitHub. And we'll go find my repository here for Twerkle. We'll add a uh, post commit hook in, and then I'll show you a uh, different way that we can deploy. This. Uh, <laughs> we'll just add a simple service again here. Well, 
update those settings. Now, anyway, I don't know if uh, many of you use uh, the deploy hooks. We'll go ahead and just uh, do a lame check-in right there. Oop, can't do that. Shoot. Messed up because I didn't actually add in the uh, stuff, so we'll just do, we'll just add a simple file. And what we're going to do is we're going to add these brackets in here with specific commands to deploy Twerkle. And then we're going to go ahead and push that. And once we push that, GitHub is going to recognize that we had that specific deploy message in there. And then if we rush over to our cloud again, we're going to see that get deployed across the instances. So I actually didn't need to click. You know, I didn't need to go to the website and click deploy. And this gives you a lot of power and a lot of flexibility if, if you want to do really fast iterations on your staging server. You can just always keep pushing out deploys and not even have to worry about the website uh, and, go, and going to the cloud infrastructure to do your deploys. So another feature that I really like, uh, person, question, go ahead. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So if uh, there, there's actually a whole, uh, there, there's a whole system that GitHub's using that lots of people are buying into the standard of you know message passing via the web, and so that's just the specific message that you put in that GitHub then posts into our environment, which then deploys your system. So one of the really neat features that I like is the idea of cloning. And what cloning gives you the ability to do is take your entire environment, clone it to another environment, and like I mentioned earlier, you can do a long migration or you can test a specific version of Rails if you like. You can make changes to that environment. You just cloned off your production to make sure when you deploy, everything is going to go okay. And the clone, the clone system is very easy. I can clone an entire system with one click. We'll just call this staging. We'll go ahead and make it production for now. We'll just let it do anything it wants with the IP address. And we'll clone the environment. I think this is a really powerful tool because a lot of people will spend a lot of money to keep up an, an entire staging environment that they may only use, or a pre-production environment, or a QA environment that they may only use for a few hours. But they're dedicating an entire system or a few systems for database and things to it. And so this allows you the really easily to clone your environment test anything you need to test, and make sure everything works with one click. And uh, Amazon's going to take a little bit to bring those things up. So with this idea of cloning, because we're using the uh, EBS system, uh, we have the ability to scale both ways. You can scale your application vertically and horizontally. When I talk about scaling an application vertically, what I'm talking about is increasing your CPU or increasing your RAM because that's your database box or that's your heavy lifting you know, background box that's run, running RabbitMQ for you. So I have a, a single environment here. And you can't actually do this live. It's, it's not something that, uh, because you, you actually want a snapshot of the system before, let's say we want to increase the disk space, we're going to go ahead and shut that application down we're going to give it a give it a few seconds to hopefully create its snapshot, finish creating the snapshots and upload them. And as we see, we can't create our environment here now, but I do have a few old uh, storage volumes that I could pick. This is an older snapshot that I ran, so I could just pick that. You know, if I I, I'm, I can wait, you know, about 30 seconds or a minute for that snapshot to finish uh, getting in place, which it is now. Um, and I can select my latest snapshots. I can increase the disk space. I'm not, you know, I could actually even grow my environment if I needed to move, if I wanted to move from a single instance to five instances, I could do that as well. I'm going to save us a little money and not do that. And I'm going to boot the configuration. So with, with uh, a few clicks, what I've done is I've just taken my environment, increased the disk space, and I'm bringing my environment up. There's a little bit of downtime involved in that. But if you handle it in an interesting way, you can prevent that downtime. Question, go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. Well, 
Well, I mean, it's technically it's not engineer creating your snapshot. Right. But yeah, I understand. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that you know it's. Um, I haven't seen too many problems with that. Although you know, I have, I have seen a few problems uh, step up. But if you shut, if if you terminate the instance, the instance is going to come down in a certain way. So your web server is going to stop. Your database is going to stop. And then the snapshot is going to get taken. So you're not going to lose any data. Things shouldn't come crashing down around you. Uh, you know. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. That's I was going to talk about that one a little bit, Joe. But there's also a, a snapshot feature that you can actually take a snapshot right then and use that as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about scaling. Ver that was scaling horizontally. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, you know what happens when you get famous on the internet. So you get on TechCrunch, you get on Dig, someone starts talking about Twitter, or you 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 get on the New York Times. You're going to need ad capacity, and ad capacity, adding capacity is quite simple. It's uh, Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to wait for the environment to come back up. OK, there. We have a cluster that we can work with there. Adding capacity is quite simple. All you need to do is add an instance to the cluster. We have uh, the ability to do utility servers as well, so those utility servers aren't going to run. Your web servers, they're going to run tools like solar or you know anything that you can configure with chef so once I click add add an instance we're just going to go ahead and add an instance you can add up to 20 instances if you need more than that you can talk to us uh, that's just where we limit it right now um, but really you know if you're if your application scales scales really well horizontally uh, that prevents the dig effect and the tech crunch effect and then whenever the, you know a week a week from now when your traffic goes down or dies down we can go ahead and terminate any of these instances that we need to to get back to the capacity we need so we're only having the capacity or actually uh, we're only putting out the capacity that we actually need we're not investing a lot in overscaling it the way that you customize uh, the environment is with a, a tool called chef and uh, chef is uh, a really interesting way to configuration manage your systems and so we wrap around all of that and it gives you the ability to do a lot of really nice custom things with your system because most of the Rails applications I see every day are not one-offs. It's not a simple website. Someone's going to want to want to run Tokyo Cabinet. Someone's going to want to play with Redis. Um, and so we'll hop over to some code here, and we'll look at a very basic uh, Chef recipe. And this one, I just opened this one up. Um, this is specifically for CouchDB. Um, Chef is uh, is written in Ruby. All looks like Ruby. Codes like Ruby. Um, and this, this statement right here simply add, uh, tells the system to add the, uh, the package on the system for CouchDB. So that'll install CouchDB, setting up, a, setting up the permissions on the log directory. We're using a template, um, or a, we're templating out the, uh, the Couch any file. We're adding a remote file, which we're using from a template uh, over here, which is actually right here. We have templates. And then we're telling it to go ahead and execute. So when this when the server start, uh, so we're going to add CouchDB to the default startup of the server in case it's not. So when the ser so when the the instance comes up, it'll go ahead and run that for us. So this is a really easy way to add CouchDB to your environment. And there's lots of other uh, Chef recipes uh, that we don't offer publicly currently. But as time goes on, we hope to put those Chef recipes out in the public for things like Sphinx. Um, you know, custom, more custom memcache setups. You can even do Mbari Ruby uh, with a chef recipe if, if you like. So this is uh, a little bit about how the environment works. As I mentioned before, we have HA proxy sitting on all of, all of the boxes. And when something goes bad, what we're going to do is we're going, to move, we're going to move that IP address over to another instance. The method it uses is the Stoneth method. Uh, if you're familiar with that, shoot the other node in the head. So the two other nodes are going to race to get the IP. One of them is going to get it. One of, them's going to, one of the application server that's still up out of the three is going to promote itself to master. System's going to realize that, oh, we lost a node. And so it's going to go ahead and bring up another node to replace that. So we still have our uh, our thing going right here. Let's let's just go ahead and connect to this box. Oops. 
and that uh, the, the little man in the middle attack, uh, because I bring up and down environments so fast, my uh, uh, SSH keys are always changing. Uh, so there's no worries about that. We'll just go ahead and do a sudo. Yeah, we'll just do a halt. Our system's going to go down. And there's a little, there's a little bit of delay in this. In this, we, um, we check every minute. If we look right now, we see that we're getting these CPU graphs are actually uh, brought in from the server, and so we see that this server is no longer reporting CPU graph, uh, CPU information. And if we actually click and try to go to the website, we'd see that it's down. So our system is always pull is is always polling and looking to see what's happening with your with your instances. And so when an instance fails. It's going to recognize that in, in one or two minutes, and it's going to bring up a replacement for that. And we can uh, sit and watch that happen, but it's a, a little bit dull. So we'll come back, and we'll see uh, that our instance has moved around. So some of the things I, I really haven't covered is that this is just isn't a Rails product. I mean, everyone is going to talk about Rails. and. Rails hosting, but we also support Merb. In fact, our application is built on Merb. Uh, we run the, you know, and we eat our own dog food. Our application runs on the on the uh, on the Amazon system as well uh, on our cloud product. You also get cron tab management. You can run multiple applications. You also have the ability and your S3 uh, access, so you can actually have your clients connect to your S3 as well. Uh, you know, you can store the files on the S3 and use, use your credentials to provide them access as well. Uh, and one of the new features that I talked a little bit about is the utility slices for when you don't need to run a web server. Some of the things that are coming, uh, we're adding features every week. These utility slices just came on last week. Yes, I think this is the biggest complaint I think that I hear from customers is that we don't support Postgres. That's something that we're hoping to get out very, very soon. Um, we don't support this uh, slave DBs and automatic failover of DBs. That's something that's coming very soon. And as you all might have known, uh, the JRuby guys uh, came to work at Engine Yard, and we you know, definitely hope to uh, provide the ability to run JRuby uh, on the cloud as well. So any other questions? Sure. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. When it, the EBS technically runs on S3, but it's a separate environment. It's a separate system. So when we talk about, there are parts of our system that use S3. So when you have a backup, that's going to be stored on S3 for you. So we do store things on that, um, and we give you we give you uh, essentially the access, the secret keys that we use to store your things. So you can use your S3 account. So you don't have to have multiple S3 accounts and two bills. You're only going to have one bill. With that you know encompasses all of your S3 usage for your application. So, sure. Um, I I think mainly because the Elastic Load Balancer is really new, um, and we were developing this before. You know, Amazon's pretty cryptic about when they do things. I mean, we just all learned about their their new uh, virtual private cluster. You know, the the VPN system that you can bring in. So they're pretty quiet. Um, it's, it's something that I know that we're experimenting and playing with and seeing, are we going to work that into the infrastructure? We've had really good luck with AJ Proxy, and a lot of the people that I know running fairly large app, applications on AWS are, are using AJ Proxy. Now, there's a little bit of CPU load involved with that on your main instance, but you know, maybe you're, you, know, you may need to use a larger instance for that. But you know, in, in general, it works for us. It's very configurable, um, and we have it today. But I know that we're definitely going to maybe you know, explore that in the future. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oops. Yeah. yeah.